Welcome to Outing the Past 2021, our very sixth festival. It is just so exciting. This year we are virtual for obvious reasons. And I'm Sue Sanders and with Dr. Jeff Evans, we coordinate the project together with our wonderful team who, like Jeff and I, volunteer our contributions and who I will introduce to you shortly. This festival presentation is one of nearly 20 such events being hosted by our festival partners that range from large national museums to smaller voluntary organisations, and we are so grateful for them to be involved. Further information about this festival hub and all the other festival events can be found at our Outing the Past website, which you can see there. The aim of the festival is to showcase the remarkable and fascinating accounts of past attitudes to sex and gender diversity, a history that has been too often marginalized and denied. In doing so, we seek to enhance the collective reading of our past and thereby provide a more inclusive and more reliable history for all. The festival is made possible by all those people who kindly answer the invitation we send out each summer to offer presentations of LGBT plus history and or unique testimony. We had 70 offers this year, which was just wonderful. These offers are firstly moderated by our academic board that make up the annual OTP Festival Gazette, from which the each festival hub partner choose their respective programmes. Our wonderful Outing the Past team that makes all this possible are, here's Dr. Jeff Evans, and he was the person who came up with the idea. This is Caroline, who looks after the Gazette. That's all the 70 presenters are put on a Gazette and then sent to the hubs. This is Lila, who does all our Zoom work and has taught us and the hubs how to use Zoom. This is Jenny, who looks after the website that you have used to discover us. This is Maisie, who looks after promotion and all the niggling details to make everything happen. This is Stephen, our OTP theatre coordinator, who is also currently working on a fantastic project in West Yorkshire, celebrating the first ever National Gay Pride March in Huddersfield, and that's for next year. And this is Ken, who oversees our academic programmes that include online seminars and when health conditions permit, our annual face-to-face -face OTP conference gathering. We really hope that you enjoy this Festival Hub presentation and please do send us our Festival Hub partners your feedback. There'll be a little um, thing at the end which you can fill in. It's a survey monkey, it's brilliant. Well, I hope you enjoy the programme and it encourages you to investigate more. It's going to be truly exciting, I think. So great to see you all. Thank you for being there. Sit back in the comfort of your home and enjoy. Welcome back everyone. Um, we'll make a, another start as it were after that wonderful video from Sue. It's lovely to just have that overview of the festival and who's involved and what the festival is about. We, the Birthplace Trust, first took part in the festival a year ago. We liked it so much we thought we'd take part in it again. And I'm joined by my colleagues Lucy Brandt and Eleanor Cole who are going to be helping us through this afternoon's activities. If you've not already turned off your microphone or video, but I think everyone has, um, please do so now because it helps the connection on Zoom. As all of you know, our programme is being presented free of charge, but in the current difficult climate, we encourage you, please, if you'd like to make a donation to the cause, please do so. We'd be very grateful. And you can do that via our website, shakespeare.org.uk forward slash donate. Uh, we'd like to suggest anything from five pounds and above. Never resist, resist a generous impulse, say I. And our events are being recorded for our archive. So if you ask a question, um, which we hope you do, you can do that through the chat facility by typing it in on Zoom, or you can raise your hand virtually and then speak the question. But if you decide to speak, you'll be recorded. So you're automatically at, um, agreeing to, to being part of the recording if you do it that way. 
Out in the Past has a survey that they'd like you to fill in, um, which is be extremely useful to them if you were able to do that. It shouldn't take you very long. And they, they'd love to have that um, reflection, the, your reflections, your comments about this program and the festival. And I'm now going to interview, interview I'm now going to introduce our two speakers. Daniel Vaux is a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts and is a museum queer heritage consultant and freelancer. As a Victoria and Albert Museum ambassador, he founded the award-winning volunteer-led LGBTQ plus tours at the museum in 2015. He's since developed similar tours for other museums and we were thrilled that he took part in our contribution to the Outing the Past Festival last year and we're delighted to welcome him back. And he's joined by Matthew Storey, a collections curator for historic royal palaces since 2014, for which he leads on LGBTQ plus research and interpretation, and for which he's chair of the LGBTQ plus forum. He works across six sites with collections ranging from old master paintings to 20th century royal fashion. He previously worked for the Victoria and Albert Museum and the National Gallery, and he's on the steering group for the Queer Heritage and Collections Group and the Collections Development Advisory Group of Queer Britain. Gentlemen, welcome. I'm happy to hand over to both of you to um, be spotlighted, which I'm doing now, and away we go. Fabulous. Well, thank you very much. Hello, Matthew. It's good to see you again. You, yes. Well, we've got a, a two-parter coming up for you, which is going to be a bit of a treat. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start telling you a bit of the admin, I suppose, a bit of uh, the story of what's happened since last year. And we'll be then turning to Matthew for a wonderful case study to talk about the idea of breaking down barriers, because that's what our session is called right now. So let me see if I can get this working nice and well. And just remember to tick share down. Fabulous. So is that the full screen or is that just the, sorry, I will get there. We will get there. Ta-da, it's like magic. It is a treat to see you all here. So thank you very much for having us. Uh, as you can see, we are the Queer Heritage and Collections Network. And what that is exactly, hopefully I'll be able to explain shortly, but uh, I please, I do invite you to use the hashtag if you, you want to, it's a rather long one, hashtag Queer Heritage and Collections Network. Uh, if you want to reach out to me, I'm at Dan Nuvo and Matthew, yours is? At Curator Matthew. That's much simpler, thank you. So we acknowledge the support of the Art Fund as well. So we're very grateful for their support in order to make all that we do at the Queer Heritage Collections Network possible. So, as was already discussed, I was delighted to have been invited to the event last year, and it was such a thrill to be at the Shakespeare Birthday Place Trust. And uh, before, rather serendipitously, something rather remarkable happened. Before I actually uh, set off on my train, I managed to meet Sarah Hewitt Clarkson from Anderton Park High School, who was telling me about a lot of the difficulties that uh, she was going through uh, because of the protests that were happening at her school when she was trying to bring in uh, inclusive LGBTQ plus education into her school and one of the things that she said that kept inspiring her was a quote from Shakespeare and I wanted to bring it to you today as well because I did a walk around of the house afterwards and I met Neil one of the wonderful people at uh, Shakespeare Birthplace Trust and Neil actually offered up uh, a reading of Shakespeare I could choose any quote and Neil would be able to do it from the top of his mind and so of course I chose the quote that Sarah had told me about so here it is. If you prick us, do we not bleed? If you tickle us, do we not laugh? If you poison us, do we not die? And if you wrong us, shall we not be revenged? So it's nice to be back now, a if year later. If you prick us, do we not bleed? In order to talk about what's happened since then, because for me, that quote has now been part of my understanding of what we're doing in terms of Queer Heritage and Collections Network, because it is about breaking down barriers. And uh, we will be talking a little bit about what we think some of those barriers are. But we'd love to hear from you as well in terms of what you think might be the things that can help unlock organizations doing queer heritage collections, uh, research and study and engaging programs. 
So the Queer Heritage Collections Network, we very kindly received funding from the Art Fund just in May of last year. So in the middle of the pandemic, in first lockdown, we uh, gave birth to a new network, which is rather remarkable. And it was founded by English Heritage, Historic England, Historic Royal Palaces, the National Trust, and the Research Centre for Museums and Galleries, which is based at the University of Leicester. And we've had our first symposium. So I get to talk about some of the amazing things that have already happened in this rather uh, difficult time. So there is a steering committee, as you can see on the left, Matthew is one of the steering, uh, represent steering group representatives. So it's a delight to have him here today, but we've also got uh, some wonderful people. Dr. Dominic Bouchard, you would have already met in the previous session and seen the amazing thing that uh, things that English Heritage are doing. Uh, we've also got Tate Greenhalgh from National Trust, Richard Sandell from University of Leicester, uh, Sean Curran from Historic England. And then we'd, we've got a team of uh, freelance support uh, who are currently working from different parts of the country. So uh, Lucy Whitehead is a researcher for us, as well as Chris Reed, both, uh, well, sorry, Lucy's based in Wales and uh, Chris is based in Northern Ireland. Now we're gonna fixate on that sort of story of what Chris is doing with Matthew in just a moment, but uh, uh, just me and above me, you've got the two co-managers, co-project managers of the, the, the network at the moment, which is uh, Rachel Lennon. Uh, wonderful Rachel Lennon, who wanted to be here today, uh, but couldn't. So I've got a quote from Rachel to kind of just talk about what we're trying to encourage collections to do and to look at how we can help as a network work with all these different collections that are coming to us to break down the barriers uh, that, uh, that are need to be done in order to, for, for all of us to be working in queer history and heritage and to be presenting amazing things. And so for Rachel, it's very much about us taking responsibility to continue to look again, to research, to better understand the lives that are lived in connection with the places and the objects that are in these wonderful collections as well. And to ask who's remembered, who's forgotten, and to understand the power behind those choices. Rachel, uh, you may be aware, was one of the instrumental minds behind the wonderful National Trust program, which was Prejudice and Pride. I'm going to show you a little bit of a video clip from that uh, uh, just before I hand over to Matthew. But we have uh, had our first symposium, and I'd love to share this with you all uh, in the chat when I finish talking so that you can kind of get an idea of the, some of the amazing things that are happening around the country. We are joined by some fantastic uh, organizations. Uh, I've already talked about the support team that is in place, but these four key organizations, um, plus the Research Centre for Museums and Galleries, have just been doing amazing things over the last few years, decades. And so it's, it's great to have the guidance of really important organizations that are committed to, to having this sort of activity at the core of their, their being, and to now be joined by over 60. So this is already outdated. When I put this up uh, for the symposium, it was 50. We've now leapt up by another 10. So there are now 60 organizations across the country, that is for regions and nations, that are wanting to engage in queer history and heritage, plus uh, some friends who are joining us from overseas as well. And uh, as of uh, this week, I should be now adding the, uh, an organization in Australia, back in Australia, back home as well, which would be quite nice, the Australian Queer Archives. But part of the research that I've been doing uh, as part of the network over the last uh, few months has been to have a chat with each of those organizations coming in. So I've had the opportunity to have about 60 conversations with people. And there seems to be a theme uh, with all these organizations as to, and, it, and you know, when you start to, to group in the concerns, it does rather neatly come down to three key barriers for them. And I hope that that's what we'll be able to address with our case study in just a moment, which is, it's to do with the barriers between you and the audience. So that's engagement and programming. It's to do with the barriers that are internal within the organizations and how do we overcome those? So that's collections and processes within the organization. And then it's how do we relate to everybody else that's doing this sort of work? How do we, how do we look beyond our collection or our organization alone? and be able to connect up with others around us and not just uh, locally around us, but we also want to talk about regions and nations as well. So that's, that's the sort of uh, the background, the context within which Matthew will pick up sh very shortly. 
So before we get to Matthew, I, I did want to show you a wonderful video that was done as part of Rachel's work for the National Trust. And I wanted to throw it in because it's got some beautiful singing in it, but it also has a wonderful quote from some really, uh, uh, some quotes that I think will help fixate the reason why we should be looking to overcome these barriers as well. last couple of years more museums and galleries have brought out their queer or LGBTQ histories than ever before which has been fantastic to have that spotlight on hidden or suppressed or silenced histories but we realise how important they are because at the same time there has been a backlash a public and press backlash against some of that visibility and there's been rising hate crime against LGBTQ people which makes us realise how important it is to tell these stories in these kinds of places today. Places of heritage, culture, can do a lot more for changing behaviours and, and supporting people to see things differently. Desire to know, desire What makes a child a child Well, that is a tough act to follow, but uh, that was, of course, David McAlmont, Richard Sandell, and Julie Howe that you just saw speaking there. And so that's enough from me. I'm now going to hand over to give you a wonderful case study from Matthew's story. Thank you very much, Dan. And how do you follow David? He's such an incredible artist. Thank you for sharing. Well, I'm going to try and get my PowerPoint up. Is that working for everyone? Can you see me? Looks good to me. Good. Okay, great. Um, you can never tell <laughs> if the technology is working. So my name is Matthew Storey. I'm a curator at Historic Royal Palaces. And I'm going to talk to you today about how Historic Royal Palaces has been breaking down barriers in its LGBTQ plus interpretation. So first of all, if you're not familiar with Historic Royal Palaces, that's okay, not everybody is. We are an independent charity. We look after six royal residences on the whole residences that are non-residential. Um, so we look after the Tower of London, Hampton Court Palace, the Banqueting House Whitehall, Kensington Palace and Kew Palace, which are all in the London area. And we also look after the Queen's official residence in Northern Ireland and the residence of the Secretary of State of Northern Ireland, and that's Hillsborough Castle and Gardens. We are an independent charity though, and we receive no money from the government or the Crown. Historic Royal Palaces has been doing a lot in the last few years to engage with LGBTQ plus lives and histories and this is a particularly joyous example of our staff at Pride in London and I think you can see holding that banner um, our chief executive and that's a really important point I want to make that work on this area has happened uh, across the organisation and at all levels of the organisation. I chair the LGBTQ plus working group at Historic Royal Palaces. And that is uh, a group that um, has people in it who work in all different parts of the organization. So our front of house staff, our warders have always been incredible in supporting this, uh, particularly in our, um, in joining Pride um, and delivering tours across our sites. Um, equally, you can see there our chief executive, John Barnes, who has supported um, inclusive histories as a one of the most important things that Historic Royal Palaces does. 
I'd also particularly like to bring to attention the work of our press and PR department. Um, you wouldn't believe that actually they have been one of the most important drivers in this work. Um, so we have two slogans at Pride uh, on our banners. One you can see there, which is bringing history out of the closet. The other is a thousand years of kings, queens and betweens, which was uh, thought up by one of our um, press officers. And it uh, really beautifully defines what we're about and always makes people smile. Now, uh, one of the uh, most tangible uh, things we've done is this exhibition. It was a display of costumes from the film The Favourite, which if you've seen it, um, is about Queen Anne and her female favourites. And um, I was watching the film and I wondered, what are they going to do about the suggestion of a uh, physical relationship between Queen Anne and her favourites? And if you've seen the film, you will know, but they make it very clear that in their view, it was a physical uh, relationship as well as an emotional and a political one. The Hampton Court Palace was used as one of the locations for the film. And as a result, our press and PR department who look after filming requests had a great relationship with the filmmakers. And so actually it was that relationship that brought in this display of costumes that had been used in the film. As a great example of cooperation across sites, which uh, across the organisation, which may not have been obvious um, to visitors, I as a curator only had a small part in delivering this display. The press office brought it in, conservation and interpretation came up with the way the, the costumes would be displayed. And I came in um, fairly near the end to do the labels and interpretation and to do the press and publicity around it. So it was a great example of uh, different departments um, working together to create a very tangible uh, result. Historic Royal Palaces is particularly well known for its live interpretation. And one I particularly like to highlight is Long Live Queen James, which happened in 2017. It was our major, well, one of our major contributions to the anniversary of the partial decriminalisation of sex between men in England and Wales in 1967, so that 50th anniversary, which was a driver for LGBTQ plus research and interpretation across the sector. Long Live Queen James was also a great example of breaking down barriers in our interpretation. It was a Jacobean drag show in Polari. Now, how, how am I gonna break that down? So it took Jacobean history, the story of King James VI on first and, and his male favorites. And it told it in the language of Polari, so the underground language between queer men that was used particularly in the mid 20th century. So very relevant for that 1967 anniversary we were celebrating. And it was performed by contemporary queer performers from the contemporary queer performance scene. It was scripted by Mark Ravenhill and directed by Scotty. So we got three historical periods mashed together. The, uh, the uh, period of the history we were talking about, the period of the anniversary we were celebrated and the incredible creativity in the queer community today. And if that's not whetting your appetite enough, uh, I'm gonna, sh and making you inquisitive enough, I'm gonna share a video so you get a sense of what that wonderful evening was like. Of the bed chamber. And 
so Queen James Bogle begins to stray to fresh It's also worth saying that an event like that um, will bring in audiences who wouldn't, I think, have come on for a family day out at Hampton Court, but might well have been tempted by an evening of culture and drinking with friends in central London. So by having a variety of different ways to talk about this history, you can reach uh, people who you wouldn't normally um, get coming into your properties. Uh, and I just want to also share a little uh, bit of the process to give you an insight into how powerful and unexpected it is um, when you work collaboratively. Oh. Don't play that video. And here we are. So this is a painting that hangs at Hampton Court. And in the development of Long Live Queen James, I showed this to the creatives, thinking it would be a useful way of explaining um, of Stuart politics, because you have George Villiers, one of uh, James VI from first favourites, right in the middle. But what the create uh, one of the uh, performers focused on was this figure, um, who has her breasts out, and that led to an exposure, uh, a um, conversation about what exposing breasts meant in seventeenth-century culture, and nudity was part of her performance practice. So um, I wasn't expecting that part of Long Live Queen James would be um, this performer's breast taking on the role of the Countess of Somerset, but it worked beautifully. So don't put up too many barriers um, as an expert. Let other people come in and interpret the material you have in their own way, because you will get incredibly powerful results. One of the other major pieces of live interpretation we had happened in 2020, and it's hard to believe that things happened in 2020 back in February. This was Queer Lives at the Tower, and it took the form of a tour at the Tower, but it was a scripted play um, and by, by the playwright Chris Bush and directed by Tom Latter. And the development process of this was really interesting because again, I was there as the curatorial expert, but I was doing a lot of handing over um, the control of the interpretation to the creatives. And one of the lead characters was this drag raven character. Uh, when you're developing uh, any piece of work, and particularly perhaps LGBTQ plus work, think of the different ways you can reach audiences. So we had a lot of discussion about what should be included in that tour. And actually, um, some of the great histories just didn't have a space there. So I thought, what a great excuse for a blog post. So that provided part of our social media um, content for 
uh, LGBT History Month in 2020. So always be imaginative and think of the different channels you can use to get your message out there. Particularly pertinent here was to help promote Queer Lives at the Tower. I had a conversation with the influencer Rowan Ellis. So across historic royal palaces, channels and Rowan's uh, channel, this video has racked up thousands and thousands of views. And it allowed me to reach Rowan's audience, an audience I wouldn't normally have been able to reach. So again, breaking down barriers between me as an expert, but acknowledging how incredible um, an influencer could be uh, to collaborate with. And I think it was one of the best things. We talked for hours because Rowan had so many good questions for me and how they ever edited it down to a 15 minute video, I don't know. So visitors to Queer Lives at the Tower would have experienced barriers being broken down. They started the tour thinking they were going to get a standard uh, tour of the heritage property with one of our warders. And then that was completely broken down when this character, the drag raven, came in and subverted the whole proceedings, leading the visitors then for a series of immersive theatrical performances. We were gender and colour blind in our casting. We didn't let that be a barrier when the actors were taking on multiple roles anyway. There was no point in having them look like the historical figures. So instead, we could be a lot more inclusive and imaginative in our casting. And it's also worth saying in this context that I wanted to break down barriers of social status in the stories we told. So we had very conventional stories that you'd expect of kings like uh, James VI and I, or Edward II. Uh, but I was really keen to get stories of prisoners. So we had um, Roger Casement and Thomas Overy in there. And also I searched hard to find uh, a story of a trans individual. And I found a member of the Royal Fusiliers, so the regiment based at the tower, uh, Kathleen Woodhouse, who seems to have uh, been regarded as male, but regarded herself as female and was brought up before Islington Crown Court as a uh, for a desertion of the army so we could get that story in there so look beyond um, social class look uh, and try and get as big a range of people who have used uh, be part of the your site's history as possible and um, moving on to Northern Ireland now this is Hillsborough Castle and Gardens it's gorgeous if you haven't been there and the tour we have there was developed by Chris Reed, who is doing his PhD on um, LGBTQ plus research and interpretation in Northern Ireland. I started Chris off by just walking around Hillsborough with him and talking about how um, my experience of doing LGBTQ plus tours and how that might be useful for Hillsborough. But I was very aware that um, Northern Ireland is a nation with its own very distinct uh, voice and identity. And so it was really appropriate that that was my, the limit of my involvement and that actually it was Chris who developed the tour using his um, knowledge and it led to a much more authentic uh, and relevant experience. And perhaps particularly important for breaking down barriers um, was how they would talk about this uh, historical figure, William III, Prince of Orange. Um, I need to hardly say he is an incredibly divisive figure to this day in, um, in Northern Ireland. And Chris deliberately chose this image of him, a very demilitarized, very young image of him, to present um, why uh, William, through his relationships with male favourites and gossip at the time, has a role in LGBTQ plus history, but left the audiences to form their own conclusions. Now I'm going to finish on a hopeful image, a rainbow over the tower, because things are difficult at the moment. The COVID pandemic uh, and has led to a huge loss of income, a hundred million pound loss of income for the historic royal palaces in 2020. 
2020, we've had to abandon um, wonderful follow-up tours at Hampton Court and Kensington Palace um, for the follow-ups to the Tower tours. Um, also, homophobia is still very, very much present. I posted a blog post last week. Have a look on our Facebook page. If you're brave enough, have a look at the comments. Some are incredibly positive and supportive. Some are hateful. And knowing how to deal with both has been very difficult. But I think I'm going to end on a hopeful note because we do believe that inclusive history should be embedded in everything we do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matthew. I think we're moving to Q and A now, so I've got about uh, ten minutes remaining. And uh... thank you, thank, thanks ever so much, Dan and Matthew. That's fantastic presentations and wonderful to ha have those uh, that, that case study about about Queen James, especially. Uh, we've got some questions coming in via the chat. Um, I thought I'd start though by asking you um, about how you go about identifying the queer stories in a historical venue and whether that process, as it were, can be replicated across other venues. Is there a sort of methodology that you, you bring to a site to start teasing out or finding out these stories? Um, well, I would say if you have a look at Historic Royal Palaces um, socials, you'll see uh, my latest blog post where I do talk about some of this. Um, so it can be a mixture of looking for what you think of as um, your written histories, obviously someone like James VI from first is a very familiar figure in this history, but also um, think about approaching your sites with a queer eye and a queer perspective. Uh, and actually, from that point of view, working with queer, queer creatives or members of the queer community, the LGBTQ plus community can help with that. Um, so don't be ashamed, don't be embarrassed, um, be, approach things with an open mind, um, make sure you're bringing in as far as you might can some really sound um, research, uh, that can be very helpful, particularly if you get a backlash when people go, that's not history, you can go, well, actually it is, um, I've got a footnote to prove it, um, but, and, and if you have that kind of information, that's great. So a mixture of research, and looking at things with a open and queer mind, I would say. Dan, do you want to add to that in any way? I, I, I agree with you, Matthew. In terms of looking at collections, uh, you know, for me, there's usually, a, a, when you approach, say, an object, you know, there's three different criteria that you could have in order to include it on something that includes an LGBTQ plus narrative. So it could be the creator was uh, queer or the, the, the sitter that is depicted could be queer, or the thing that for me is most important is, it's something that the community has come to see and said, oh, there's, there's our, there's, we can see ourselves reflected in this. And so the, the audience, the community coming to something and querying it as well is really important. So I think that's what you're sort of saying there, Matthew, very much that idea of, you know, when you bring a performer in to, to counterpoint a particular uh, work or, or, you know, very famous work, for example, that act of querying is also quite important. And I think that, you know, in the context of what we see with Shakespearean theater and, you know, when you were talking about uh, uh, gender blind casting uh, and gender and, and color blind casting, uh, Matthew, I mean, when you start to do that with, with Shakespearean works, for example, you get the same effect where it start, you can start to, uh, a, something that you may not say was queer before, now there's a queer lens applied to it. And so the act of querying that, I think, suddenly changes the work and, and, and makes it uh, a possible for so many different people to uh, interpret it and understand it and relate to it in a different way that wasn't, uh, you know, it, it may not necessarily be there in the lines, but sometimes it's in between the lines. Yeah, it's, it's, it, the, the, it's articulating what constitutes that queer lens, isn't it? How, I mean, how one might go about articulating what, 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 what constitutes that lens? What, was it, what, what are the things which we need to be equipped with in order to see by? I think that this is the thing for me, which is when we work with audiences coming into the collections that I work with, it's often saying to them that you've got the equipment as it were, you've got what it takes to do it already. So your instinctive read of it, that first impression that you get from the work, and I think that's very much what you're talking about, Matthew, the, the queer eye, the, the, the queer gator, um, the, you know, the, the sense of being able to connect with something. I think we've all got that. And I think it's the ability to trust that first instinct. Sure, back it up with further research, go away and study and you know, learn about how you can start to articulate that in, 
in concrete ways. But I think that first instinct, everybody's got that ability to connect with uh, a piece of literature, a, a work of art or, you know, a, a play. It's a question about your scripts and whether they're available uh, to use because it'd be a great teaching resource. Oh, uh, for historical analysis. Um, that I am not sure. I mean, anybody's welcome to contact me. I think copyright is, uh, is a potentially an issue. Um, I didn't manage a relationship with the creatives that was looked after by our live interpretation um, department, but um, I can, if anyone is interested, I can please do get in touch. Um, Twitter's probably easiest, Accurator Matthew, and I can talk to our live interpretation staff. That's best I can say um, at the moment. But they were great, and it's so sad. I just want to get, I want to get them out again, and I want to have the work we were developing uh, seen. So one day. I, I wonder in your work whether you, you talked a little bit about Polari and how that was a language among um, gay men in the mid. 20th century and you used it for the Long Live Queen James project. I, w I wonder about as it were retrieving an LGBTQI lexicon across time. You know Polari is a kind of obvious example but in your, in your um, research in the many objects that both of you come across across centuries and stories and documents and accounts and so on whether there's a case for, as it were, assembling a lexicon, an LGBTQI lexicon, which can be dated and understood and contextualized. Language is really, and terminology is really central uh, to this. Um, as probably a lot of people are aware, uh, LGBTQ, these are relatively recent terms. Um, post 19th century and so um, language when you're looking in the past is uh, it, it's not fraud I think it actually gives you a lot of opportunities um, so if I'm talking about the past I'll usually be descriptive so I'll talk about same-sex love same-sex desire lived as a man lived as a woman um, and describe what I see rather than put values on the past but if you start looking at the contemporary documents you do get all kinds of interest in um, Things. Sometimes, um, I talked about this quite recently, um, pornography um, or more scurrilous stuff can give you really quite vivid terminology. Um, I'm not going to go too far into um, what the game of flats uh, when talking about women um, could mean, but that's an 18th century bit of um, terminology. Um, Dan, just last night at the British Library, was talking about molly houses and the phenomenon of mollies and what that term means and what that meant to people at the time and then um what does a detestable act in a in a tudor piece of legislation um mean um that's a really vivid term that you get coming up all the time so um lang language is incredibly rich um it, it is changing um uh, i think it's worth when you are doing this kind of work distinct being very clear about the kind of language you're using are you using contemporary language because that communicates very clearly to modern people as a useful shorthand for talking about people in the past are you talking about people in the past in a descriptive way or are you using the language of the past and of course the language of the past has the ability to offend if it's not understood um, properly. So that should usually be done carefully and with a, perhaps explaining your choice of language. I think this is something that um, Marina Shoplin is going to be talking about in the next session at four o'clock and how we research the archive for, as it were, clues for, for, for um, uh, non-heterosexual lives, as it were. Great. Um, anything else you'd like to tell us before we say thank you to both of you? How can we? How can we? How can we join your symposia, Dan? Or can we? Do we have to be an organisation only, or can individuals sign up? Uh, at the moment, it's with organisations. So we'd love to work with you, for example, um, and the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust. I think you know. We, know, we noticed we were not on your list, and <laughs> no. we're trying to get onto it. Rest assured. Absolutely, it's it's a very easy process. If you're so if you're watching from a, a collection, you know, we'd love to hear from you because it's about 
the, the more support we can give to each other, um, the, the better the work will be. I, I also think that uh, if you are an individual interested, um, watch this space where we are, we, we will be expanding, but we are waiting to hear about funding as well. So as we are able to, to secure that, um, we will be looking at how we can include individual researchers as well, because I think that's something that seems to be very important uh, to some come from the symposium as well. It's a question in from chat that I, I just missed a moment ago. How do you win over volunteers who may resist querying? In your project. Hi. Hello, Peter. It's good to see you. Um, so, um, from Shropshire. So, uh, um, Shrewsbury, in fact. Uh, so, I think that there's two. There's two things I think of that particular question, which is on one hand, you know, it's the, the use of the word queer. Perhaps it might be that you know, being used since the 16th century. Uh, I subscribe to the Claire Barlow methodology of using the word in that it does do exactly what Matthew was sort of saying. It allows you to to look at the past without necessarily needing to be, you know, was this same-sex attraction a lesbian relationship? Well, you could say it was queer. It allows an umbrella to be used. Uh, in terms of the resisting the querying, if it's a, a, an, an action that they're doing, I, I think that uh, with the volunteers that I work with, it's always about working with them and understanding what it is that they're interested in, what it is that they want to contribute, because their contribution, and this is a strong part of co-curation, isn't it? What they would like to, to add to the story is really important, and working with them to do that, I think, is the most important part. So however that manifests itself, I mean, that's the, that's the thing as a good co-curator, is to kind of just be able to work with that. I, I I've worked less with volunteers, but have worked with staff from different levels of the organisation. And it's taking people with you, it's enjoy having them as part of the discussion. And for Shaping Queer Lives at Tower, we worked with our front of house team who had really strong views about how they told history at the Tower. They were absolutely sure they wanted to tell LGBTQ plus histories, but um, they weren't, for instance, up for having fictionalised characters in the play. And, and so we, we abandoned that idea. We listened to them and we said, OK, well, we'll make sure all of the characters we have, we know both, those characters were there. So, um, and, and both, and both, and they were, they were there from the very beginning of the, of the process. And I think that's also really important as well. Don't be hierarchical, um, get people involved, um, explain what you're doing, have those conversations, then don't, don't impose on people because often your volunteers, your front of house, they have the people who know most, they know what visitors want, um, they care most about the organisation and, and about the site. So get, get them in from the beginning, chat to them. Um, so important. Gentlemen, thanks ever so much. We say strength to your elbows as you continue to break down barriers and change behaviours and encourage us to see things differently. And you've empowered us this afternoon through history and through your contemporary expressions of it. So thank you very much indeed.